Hello, and welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Maroos, founder and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. Embedded payments has become the norm in our personal lives. In fact, a report from IDC predicts that 74% of digital consumers' payments globally will be conducted via platforms owned by non-financial institutions by 2030. Unfortunately, IDC also found that 73% of legacy financial institutions globally have technology infrastructures for payments that are far from future ready. Today, we have Bob Ventrakia, CEO and co-founder of Zeta on the Banking Transform podcast. Bavin discusses how embedded payment technologies are becoming available to organizations of all sizes, allowing legacy banks and credit unions to keep pace with technology leaders. So welcome to the show today, Bavin. You know, in the past, updating technology in the payments area would require a lengthy vendor selection process, an onboarding process, and covering everything from compliance to integration with the existing technology infrastructure. The good news is that there are now providers that can really streamline this process, allowing organizations to modernize their payment offerings faster than ever. So, Bob, and before we even start, how about tell us a little bit about yourself and also your, your company, uh, Zeta? Thank you. Thank you for having me um, on the show, Jim, and um, uh, we'd love to answer that. So I'm Bhavan. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Zeta. A um, bit of my background, I've been a serial tech entrepreneur for the last 25 years. Um, techie at heart, I started coding when I was 10 years old, back in 1989, before kind of pre-internet, pre-sort um, of, you know, um, hard disks even, I guess, MS-DOS and CC++ days and never looked back. Um, started my first company when I was 17 in 19, 1998 in the cloud services and hosting space. Uh, bootstrapped that, you know, along with my younger brother, we ran that for about 14 years, and then and that was our first exit. We sold that company in in 2014. Uh, and then parallelly, I've started three other companies. I started a company called Radix in 2012. Um, put in 25 million of my personal capital, grew it to about a half a billion dollar enterprise, and I have a CEO on a team that runs the show today. So I'm not day-to-day -day involved in that uh, anymore. Um, started a company called Titan in 2014, which uh, WordPress recently invested 30 million at a 300 million valuation into that company last year. And then really the, the company project or you know, organization I spend most of my time on now is, is a company I founded in 2015, co-founded with a gentleman called Ramki. Um, um, so Zeta was uh, sort of founded, co-founded in, tw in 2015, uh, putting about 40 million of our personal capital and specifically with Zeta, the golden objective, Jim, is um, one of the industries, uh, uh, banking is probably one of the only industries where uh, there hasn't been a meaningful software refresh for over two, three decades. A large number of financial institutions across the globe are still using legacy technology was written 20, 30 years ago, some of it before I was born, actually, even. Um, and you know, most other um, enterprise software has seen a complete refresh, and our perspective was in this day and age, software that was written before the cloud existed, before modern software paradigms existed, before smartphones existed, they can't really truly serve the needs of and the demands of consumers today. Um, they don't provide modern digital experiences. Banks are very slow to innovate. Uh, they're not sort of you know fast and agile. And our perspective was, um, um, you know, you can't you can't really your customers demanding smartphones. But you can you only have parts to build a feature for. You can't really take those parts and build a smartphone. There's all this legacy tech. No matter what you do, you're always going to be encumbered and handicapped by it. And so we took on this. Um, you know, I always said that entrepreneurship requires a healthy dose of delusion. So we took on this sort of ambitious goal of um, essentially rewriting the entire banking stack. So pretty much all the software that you need to run a bank. This is the sort of core banking suites from the likes of Oracle, Infosys, Pfizer, the payment processing suites, you know, from again, Pfizer, FIS, TSIS, uh, the merchant acquiring platforms, such as, you know, WorldPay, a global payment, TSIS, et cetera, basically for issuer and payment processing, merchant processing and core processing. And today we have the world's only kind of full stack, modern cloud native platform that basically enables uh, banks to launch any retail or commercial banking product, this can be asset products, liability products, payment products, so ranging from credit cards, debit cards, 
loans, deposits, prepaid accounts, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're live in about um, seven different countries, including North America, where we've launched our credit processing suite to start with uh, for a modern credit card experience for banks and, and fintechs. So our customers are globally banks and fintechs. And um, we also recently, last year, we raised uh, $280 million um, at a $1.5 billion valuation from, uh, from SoftBank, uh, MasterCard joined in as an investor, and a few other investors, basically. Um, so yeah, the goal with Zeta is to really um, provide a modern-day platform, um, a cloud-native microservices architecture based on a platform to banks and fintechs that enables them to be faster, more nimble, um, and really create beautiful experiences for their customers. So it's interesting, as you mentioned, you've been building tech companies for more than two decades, 25 years. So that makes you a veteran of, of being a challenger in traditional industries, but also being aware of economics ups and downs. So as an entrepreneur that's seen a lot of this in the past, what evergreen lessons have you learned that really allows you to stay relevant and a constant challenger? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, <laughs> it's always easy to, I guess, summarize um, lessons learned after sort of with hindsight bias. You know, I've probably made every possible mistake in the world as an entrepreneur across the last right. 25 years. Um, you know, I've by now I've kind of um, I've kind of boiled down. So all my businesses have been B2B SaaS businesses. You know, this is the fourth company Zeta. It's also a B2B SaaS kind of enterprise business. Um, so in the software sort of as a service uh, uh, delivery mechanism. Um, and I think over time, I have developed in some sense when I'm starting these new businesses, kind of a model that I go through that I see kind of each, each company and not just even each company within Zeta, I would say each product go through these four phases. I kind of call them as a, um, planning, discovery, scaling, and steady state. So every business or every product or every project or every company kind of goes through these four phases. And it's interesting because once you create this framework, you truly realize what kind of capital, what's, what are the deliverables, what are you looking at the entry criteria and exit criteria for each phase. So if you break it down, I think of planning as uh, figuring out that I want to build this product or get into this business. And at that point, the idea is to solve for basically truly get an understanding, the deliverables of planning stages, understand who's the persona, what is the problem they're facing? Why is my product going to solve that problem you know, 10x better than any existing solution they have? If I build this product, how am I going to go to market and actually find a channel that I will be able to use to sell this product? What is my revenue model? And what is my moat so that I can make sure the business is sustainable and competition is not going to quickly jump in and, and take away what I have, right? So it's these six variables that I'm trying to establish through primary research, secondary research, finding out all the unknown unknowns, et cetera, until you get sort of a clear, um, um, sort of validated approach to each of these. I have a clear persona that has a clear problem. So in this case, banks and fintechs are using legacy technologies. They can be fast, they can be nimble, they can be agile, uh, they can provide modern experiences, they can hyper-personalize their products. I mean, there's 5,000 credit card programs in the US. All of them have only two differences. It's interest rates and reward programs. They're really all alike. Right. So, you know, they're not hyper-personalized like tech products are today. So there's all these problems that they face. Well, what's my product going to do? How is it going to solve it better? So we create this modern platform that will um, meaningfully enable sort of speedier innovation, enable modern experiences, hyper-personalization, stream next-gen configurability in terms of kind of things you can do in terms of credit card programs, debit card programs, et cetera, and things like that, right? How am I going to market? Well, I'm going to directly go and sell to banks. What is my revenue model, pricing model? And then it's an enterprise software. We by default have a moat because once a client comes in, you know, um, it's very hard for them to leave, um, right? The integrations, the effort, and the investment, right? So that's, the, that's the planning stage. Then you move on to discovery where you're basically building the MVP, as we call it. There's all these acronyms. Building the MVP to get the PMF, which is your product market fit. And the definition of product market fit is a high NPS, which is your net promoter score, and kind of a high retention, low churn, right? So in the discovery stage, the goal is to get to a, a minimum viable product that people like, that people will use, that people will pay you for, that people will retain, and finding one traction channel that works. And once you've got all this set up, then you move to the scaling stage, where you now put in capital, you're expanding within geography, outside geography, and essentially pumping in capital to get more customers, 
and then eventually you move to kind of the steady state phase. And so that's the template. You know, I made a series of mistakes. I'm trying to skip steps. You know, assume an idea in my head. It's like, oh wow, this is an amazing product. Everybody's going to want to buy it, and then go out there and find out after a couple of million dollars of investment that actually nobody wants it. So I have learned the hard way that you can't skip these steps. There's a lot of them. If you're right. starting out in a new industry, no domain knowledge, you really have to go through those steps to reduce risk, you know, increase speed, maximize the probability of success. So, so it's interesting. You know, when we look at the industry overall, the financial services industry, obviously the payments area is the really seems to be the most evolutionary has has had the most change in it. So how do you see the payments industry and the card industry evolving over the last several years? But how do you see it evolving going forward as well? Sure. So I I actually would say in many ways that the payments industry and the landscape has actually not changed at all for the most part. I think the first credit card was launched by Bank of America, right? The Bank of America card more than 50 years ago. And when I look at that card physically and what it did, for the most part, the cards we carry in our wallets today do the exact same thing. They literally, they have a, you know, back then it wasn't a 16 digit number, but there was an account number on it. You would take it to a merchant, you would buy something. There's really not much that has changed. You're taking a loan, you revolve it, you pay interest on it. But there's really not much that has changed. You know, we still use the same protocols. Um, ISO 8583 for sending out payment messages. Most systems still operate in batch processing mode. Uh, most systems, most platforms are running on legacy mainframe platforms that are really hard and cumbersome to manage, don't have the ability to sort of, you know, today when I look at software, Facebook, Instagram, Google, Amazon, customers expect um, certain things by default, right? Every customer sees a different experience. When you open Facebook and I open Facebook, when you shop at Amazon, when you search at Google and I search at Google, the results are personalized, the experience is personalized. The software keeps updating. There'll be new features that'll be launching you know, every two weeks, every three weeks. Um, right. there, there are general paradigms you accept in this day and age. There's you know, high degree of self-service, high degree of control. None of those are actually inherently present in the cards and payments industry. Uh, because the fact that you know most of the stacks are legacy, things haven't changed for a while. And so really, I do see modern platforms like us, this is a, I think this is a cusp, um, uh, kind of an inflection point for the industry, where um, platforms like us are going to bring about a sea of change, I think, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to financial institutions and the experiences they provide to their customers. And there's a few areas um, th that I strongly feel, you know, will will sort of um, few few trends that I strongly feel we'll see for for financial institutions that leverage these kind of leverage, you know, platforms like Zeta. So one is we we talk about this whole notion of hyper personalization, right? Which is how do you ensure each customer gets unique experiences, whether it's in the form of unique interest rates, unique limits, unique reward programs, unique controls to be able to control their like, you know. Um, personal expense management, their family expense management, create solutions that allow me to create virtual cards for single time use or create a pocket money card for my child and then, you know, block them from spending money after 9 p.m. every night, you know, get notified whenever they spend money, block certain merchants, like really control what, what technology can truly allow today, really control the experience, you know, be able to convert transactions into loans and back, like control the entire experience at an issuer level, at an account holder level, at a account level, at a card level, and each individual part of your persona getting an ability to personalize that experience for themselves, to make financial services work for me. You know, transactions, nobody gets up in the morning and says, you know, I'm excited, I have to make five payments today. People are making, a, payments are always a means to an end. They're, they're trying to achieve a purpose. And how do we leverage technology to manifest that purpose in the right way, provide the most convenient experience? Payment should be like a utility service, like nobody, you know, you, don't, you open your tap in the morning, water comes out, you don't really think about how that happens because it's a utility service. It's like what you can do with it and how you can really, you know, create these sort of personalized experiences. So hyper-personalization, I think, is going to be an important trend. Um, embeddable banking, I think, is going to be very, very uh, uh, important also, right? I think in some sense it happened to communications. Um, back in the day with physical letters and SMS and perhaps even email to a certain extent, communication was purely transactional. Its purpose was to get a message from point A to point B, and that's all it did. 
But today, if you think about communication, you don't even realize it. But communication in so many forms is embedded into experiences in different ways, right? TikTok is a communication app that allows a one-to-many communication. You know, YouTube is a communication platform. Twitter is a communication platform. Telegram is a communication platform. You have chat inside Instagram. You have, you have all these different platforms that serve different, different purposes. And instead of having a central transactional processing platform, communications become embedded into all of these experiences. Finance is going to go through the is already going through the same revolution, which is, you know, it's not about me taking a loan or me taking me making a payment to Jim. It's about contextual experiences when I need them. So, you know, yep. when I'm at a merchant, I need a loan. That's when that financial service needs to be embedded there. You know, when I'm at a merchant, I need to use my reward points automatically. I shouldn't have to like figure out this complex web of, you know, where's my loyalty card and where's my credit card and why can't I do a single transaction that automatically marries it? Like things that will embed financial services at the point or in the context where I need them. Uh, and, and, and again, legacy platforms can't enable them. They don't have APIs. They don't have you know capabilities that allow sort of embeddability. But um, our suite and any modern platform would typically have you know capabilities that allow you to kind of embed these financial experiences. And so banks can participate in sort of a you know in this sort of fintech revolution. We have this unique model in our platform. But if you're a bank that's using our platform, we allow you to create what are called virtual banks within your bank. We call them VBOs, virtual bank operators. So you could be a tenant. You can create 100 VBOs. You can assign products to those VBOs. So one of them can be given to Uber to distribute a special credit card for their drivers. Another one could be given to a Kroger's for them to create a loyalty card for their customers. Another one could be used by your business unit for creating a cashback rewards card. And so you've got all these different VBOs that are kind of mini charters within your bank that can be leveraged by fintech partners and by co-brand partners and by agent banks to essentially um, um, distribute, digitally distribute your products. There's all these sort of interesting capabilities that will allow for embeddable banking and our platforms natively embeddable banking ready, but it will, you know, enable sort of embeddable banking. And I think that's another trend. Hyper-personalization, embeddable banking is another trend that I think will really revolutionize the space. And then I think there's a lot of, you know, digital experiences that are now feasible for higher security, for family expense management, for better budgeting, uh, for, you know, uh, for the longest period of time, credit cards were all about um, essentially providing the customer a loan, making money on interest. But you have now the ability to sort of tie it in with this notion of, well, how do I actually uh, enable the customer to improve their credit score and improve their, you know, financial wellness and financial health? And and so it's going to be all these meaningful digital experiences that can also now be, um, you know, provided to customers because of what's possible through uh, through modern technology. Higher degree of transparency, you know, exactly what's happening, which merchants am I spending money at, am I spending, you know, uh, is some, you know, there's so many times, there's, there's so many issues that have never been solved for. Like there are times when I look at my credit card statements, like five different services that are charging me money every month that I never use, but I don't freaking know how to cancel them. And I can't block them very easily to stop charging my card. Like things, tiny things like those that should have just been, you know, easily achievable through smart devices that we carry in our hands, but have never been built before because the existing platforms don't allow for those capabilities. So I definitely think that there's going to be a sea of change in the uh, sort of payment processing environment led through modern technology that will enable hyper-personalization, embeddable banking, modern digital experiences um, that banks can leverage. So when you're talking about the modern technology for payments and you talk about what Zeta brings to the clients, you know, you, you one of the things you really bring up is the whole idea of hyper-personalization and yet all overall financial institutions find this really difficult concept not to know about what it means but to distribute it to implement it why do you find it so difficult because this is a this is a foundational element of your your solution why do you think the financial institutions have such a difficult time really bringing the level of personalization that's needed especially in payments but across the whole organization you know jim i think um it's not as much actually a function of lack of imagination. You know, sometimes people will um, say, yeah, banks are old institutions. They're not modern companies. They don't have the right DNA. They can't think of, you know, interesting ideas. 
The truth is when we talk to many of these financial institutions, um, we really find several of them are, I mean, there's definitely examples of that, but there's many of them that are fairly progressive, uh, that have you know large digital teams that are thinking of new you know modern experiences, etc. So not as much lack of imagination as it is uh, that the platforms that power these institutions don't enable these capabilities. For instance, okay. typical bank. We're talking to one of the top five institutions. In the country. We're in kind of final stages and discussions with them. And they're like, from the time we conceptualize a product, right? So we've conceptualized it. Forget hyper-personalization. This is a standard product. It takes us about six to eight months to configure it completely and, launch, and get it to launch stage. Now, that's just unacceptable. It's not that they're writing code and they're building something brand new. There's a system that's already running credit cards. They've been using it for more than 20 years. And now to launch a new product, a standard product, not a configurable, personalizable one, takes them six to eight months because the underlying platform doesn't provide the capabilities, interfaces, APIs to be able to have make that configuration happen. Like we've shown demos where we literally set up a bank, define a credit card product, set it up, um, created a card, started transacting, all of it in less than four hours. And people's you know jaws drop just looking at that, thinking like, wow, this is even possible because they're so used to that process taking like, Excel sheets and documents and emails sent in to and fro, and then the vendor does some of the configuration, they do some of the configuration, the testing processes, all of it. Like I, I was seeing a demo of one of the systems, one of our legacy competitors, and people are still logging into an IBM, uh, IBM 3670 green screen emulator to configure these products, right? This is, this is an yeah. interface that even I didn't use back in 1989 when I started you know, programming on computers, it didn't exist for me, right. but that's still being used in banking to configure these products, right? So, so the platforms are so far away from what modern technology can enable that, you know, even if they wanted to, they couldn't. And I think there's several aspects to it. One is, does the platform support it? It doesn't. Second is the platform supports it. Hyper-personalization is not about, let me give Jim X and let me give, you know, Sean Y and so on and so forth, right? Intelligent decisions need to be made to figure out how to personalize. How do I personalize Jim's credit line, his interest rates? For, for instance, one of the interesting capabilities that our credit card platform has is we support a per transaction interest rate. This is unheard of in the industry. For the last 40 years, you've had one interest rate for cash transactions, another one for balance transfer, third one for retail. That's pretty much all the flexibility that you get. So there's balance buckets and you assign interest rates to them. In our platform, I can define a different through automated filters. So based on time of day, transaction parameters, uh, you know, who's transacting, where are they transacting, which merchant, what amount, I can decide and apply different differential interest rates to different you know, transactions at a poor transaction level. Now imagine the flexibility you can get with this, right? I can actually auto-define rules that say, I'm going to go out there and establish a partnership with Uber or with Amazon and say every one of my customers normally pays, pays a 14.99% APR, but up to $500 at Amazon, they get a 5% APR. Now there's a tripartite win-win-win relationship that I can create as a loyalty program that's not just reward points, but actually impacts your interest rate. Or I can say, you know, customers are not spending a lot of money you know, on Wednesdays. So anybody who shops on a Wednesday, you know, I'm going to give them a 5% APR for anything they buy on a Wednesday, things like that, right? Like you could never have imagined these kinds of capabilities. I can say customers that have been inactive for the last 90 days, get an interest waiver for, for a month, things like that, right? So, and this is just one example. It's interest, it's speed, it's, you know, transaction limits and policies, spend limits and policies. So, so one is configurability of the system itself. The second is how do you make these intelligent decisions? How do you enable these intelligent decisions? The third level of personalization comes with delegation of control. So when can I say that I offer you a truly personalized experience, Jim? One is I give you a unique curated experience from my side, but the second thing is I let you modify it because you want to change certain things. You might want to select categories where you get rewards. You might want to <clears throat> change your spend limit. You might want to, as I said, create like we have use cases, I have a card on my platform, a primary account, and I can create a, an add-on physical card, give it to my driver, 
my chauffeur. And I configured it such that this card, it's borrowing off of my primary limit, but it can only be used at a specific gas station that's near my house for up to $200 a week. So now I don't need to bother with like giving him cash to fill fuel in my car or figuring out that he's sort of spending it elsewhere or things like that. The system takes care of it. There are financial problems and challenges that everyone goes through managing my you know, child spends, managing, sharing an account with my spouse or partner, managing my household expenses. There are real problems that can be solved with technology if I had the control to configure my experience. None of the platforms that they allow for that. Our platform provides APIs that allow you to configure these settings per user so that you can expose them as user interfaces to the user themselves. So you can truly create a personalized program that actually can be personalized not just by you, but by the end user. And so it's, it's all a function of the underlying technology stack, right? I mean, if I give you uh, a Ford and say, you know, go and enter the Formula One race, you're never going to be able to win because you need a Formula One race car to do that, right? So without that, you know, um, platform, you're already handicapped. Um, um, and, and that's really, I think, the primary reason that's... Um, that's um, preventing these financial institutions from being able to actually uh, create these kind of experiences. So, so you, you mentioned speed and scale a little bit about the whole issue of being able to implement a solution for with a financial institution with legacy back office technology and be able to do it at, at really a quick speed. Is this a normal situation for you? I mean, obviously the slowness is determined a lot of times by the approval process within a financial institution, but you can bring a firm up and running less than a month with your technology? And we've done it in, in far less than a week sometimes. So there are, you know, assuming all the compliance stuff and the regulatory stuff and the permissions right. and the approvals and the business plan is all in place. I'm talking about the number of steps and the amount of time it takes just to set things up. And, and this is, you know, we've seen this time and again in, in different industries. Take, um, uh, you know, take startups. You know, when, if you, if 15, you know, 20 years ago, when I started my tech company and I created an online application and I wanted to host it and start selling SaaS to the world, look at the number of steps I had to go through and the amount of time it took me. So I would go to a co-location facility and buy a cage and electricity. I'd buy a network connection from an ISP. I'd buy a server from Dell. I'd buy an operating system from Red Hat and install it on this machine, connect the machine, test everything works, create redundancy, and then I can put my application and start business. Process would typically take about a month, month and a half. Today, in front of you right now, I can go to AWS or Google Cloud or Azure, and within 30 seconds, I can provision that entire server with the software, with the operating system, with redundancy, everything that I need, and start my startup the same day. So technology definitely makes it very, very easy to substantially reduce the time that it takes to provision resources. But you have to leverage it. If you're going to still use you know, mainframes that were built in the sort of 80s, you're not going to be able to get that benefit. So, so definitely, there is a lot of stuff that we do that meaningfully reduces the number of steps, provides far more easier GUI interfaces, um, enables, you know, through programmatic interfaces to be able to configure a product, which, you know, substantially improves your speed and ability after you made some initial preparatory steps, you can replicate things much more easier, right? Stuff that you couldn't do, like today I can create an Amazon server programmatically. Imagine calling an API and essentially getting a data center, internet connectivity, electricity, a machine, an operating system, and a software. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you couldn't even imagine it. How can you do that through an API? There's a physical box. There's a you know, physical facility. Like You have to put it all together. But now that's available programmatically through an API. What, I, what would take me, you know, if I had to re repeat that step 200 times, I would physically have to send somebody to the data center 200 times to 200 machines and repeat that same process. But now, if I have to repeat that on AWS 200 times, in the same one second, I can actually repeat that process 200 times because there's an API to do that. So there's all these modern paradigms that platforms provide today that don't exist in legacy platforms. So that six months time, a large chunk of that is wasted in processes that you otherwise would be able to fully automate. Um, you know, we have this interesting, uh, all of our, we call it configuration as code. So every product that you configure on the Zeta platform, 
actually sits in Git, in GitHub, basically, in a in a code repository, like in a GitHub repository, yep. right? And what that means now is all of the steps. Imagine what you would do in a previous version where Jim would log into a 3670 emulator, configure a product that's already going to take him, you know, weeks, if not months. Then in comes in Sean to check everything that Jim did manually. It's like, oh, did Jim mess up the interest rate here? Did Jim mess up the fee here? And so on and so forth until, you know, the approval process is over and then you launch the product. Well, because we have configuration as code in a Git repository, all of the checking steps that were being performed manually can now be programmed into a script. So you now have a pipeline. It's like a, it's like a, it's like I would make a car and somebody else has to check for defects manually, but now I have robots doing it so that process can be instantaneous. So you you so now you configure a product programmatically or manually. That's up to you with a better interface. You do it much faster in the order of days as opposed to months. But now all the checks that Sean had to repeat every time can be scripted. You just click a button, run that script. It will do all the 2,000 checks. And you know, you're done in, in, in a matter of 30 seconds that the product is actually configured according to policies of the bank. So there's all these things that are available with modern systems that substantially shrink that process of being able to launch a product uh, to a minuscule level. And then the other thing that sort of I find in terms of speed and agility is it's not just about launching the product, it's about how do you keep pace with the market? How do you deliver new features and functionality and capabilities at the speed of thought, let's say, if you will. And again, there, legacy systems, because they don't expose you know, every functionality as an API, we were built as a, what's called a, it's, if you see the Mac Alliance, it's basically microservices architecture, API first, cloud native, and headless. Right? And so we were built as a headless API first platform, um, fulfilling all those sort of you know, fundamental characteristics you would expect in an enterprise platform today by default. But what that means is everything in the system by default can be done using an API. That's, in fact, that's how it's designed ground up. Whereas with most legacy systems, APIs are like an afterthought, which means that if tomorrow I want to build a new feature, I'm going to be like, I want to build this capability for the user. I want to give them this functionality where he can get a dynamic CVV or he can auto change his pin every day or whatever it is, right? Um, but now to build that functionality, I first have to go to my vendor, tell them I want to build this. They will solution it out. They'll say, hey, this is going to need five changes in our product. That process will result in a professional services quote. Then it'll take six months for them to build it, another three months to test it. Then you can start your exercise. By the time you're here, like the world's moved on 10 steps ahead. But with an API first approach, Pretty much anything that you want to do, APIs, events, interceptors that we provide, you don't have to ever come to us. You're fully self-service. As long as you understand the documentation, you don't need to come to us. You can build whatever you want. So some of these paradigms will substantially improve speed and agility at launch time for launching new products, for configuring new products, for changing configurations as well as for launching new features, functionalities, experiences on top of the platform. You know, you, you bring it up and, and some of our other guests have brought up as well. The power of partnership, the power of collaboration with outside partners that make it so you don't have to build it from scratch yourself, but work with these partners that have really their handle on technology, but more importantly, the ability to deliver very specialized solutions at speed and at scale it's extraordinarily powerful and it allows traditional financial institutions to catch up to the marketplace. As I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, there's no place that that technology and innovation has happened more than in the payments area, I don't believe. And as a result, your solution actually can embed within te technology that is antiquated at best in the traditional financial institution, but really bring them up to speed very quickly for things like embedded banking and banking as a service and meeting all the regulatory requirements and the compliance issues. You know, overall, that's that's a tremendous power of partnering with outside firms that have really brought new ideas to the marketplace in a way that can integrate with what is basically legacy financial institutions. You know, one of the things that we talk about a lot also is the ability to get visibility into the volumes of data that's created, certainly in the payments marketplace. How does a modern processor such as Zeta help organizations address the issue of getting visibility into the data, but even more importantly, the ability to democratize 
the insights that are created across the organization? Uh, that's a great question, Jim. And again, um, so at Zeta, um, so our, our processing platform is called Tachyon. It's accompanied by a data platform called Zeus. And Zeus comprises of essentially multiple different data products. So you have some really amazing flexibility that's available within the platform. So how's the platform structured? We have a series of modules. There's a bunch of foundation modules. Uh, there's a bunch of account modules. These modules, each in turn are comprised of dozens of microservices. And each module solves for different, different concerns. So we have a module called Aura, which is basically our infinitely scalable ledger service that handles things like statementing, cycling, accounts, ledgers, journals, calendar, clocks, interest calculations, fee calculations, et cetera, stuff that you would do with an asset or liability account. There's another module that handles account holders, another module that handles transactions and payments, another module that handles uh, um, um, uh, cards and instruments and so on and so forth. And all these modules are constantly generating data because there's data is being generated because there's new accounts being created, new transactions being created, new statuses are changing, information is changing. So, we have the ability to provide you multiple layers of abstraction of this data that you can put to different, different uses. At the raw, most sort of fundamental level, we provide what we call a live event stream. That's at the lowest level. So you can subscribe. We have a service that sits on top of, our, of a Kafka implementation called Atropos. Everything that happens in the system, you know, new card, new payment, auth, cancel, capture, reversal, refund, fraud, anything that takes place in the system is fired as an event to a central you know, event repository or PubSub engine, and you can subscribe to various topics as a bank or an issuer, and we'll fire you that event in near real time to an endpoint you provide. This is data in its rawest form. It's most complex because it's everything in the system exposed to you, most number of attributes, thousands of different events, but you get every piece of information in the system in real time. That's the lowest layer. Now, on top of this OLTP system, as you call it, the live transaction processing system and the live modules, we then have data transformers that take all this raw data and convert it into a data mart by product. So we have a credit card data mart, a debit card data mart, a deposits data mart. These are pre-configured data models that have much more structure to them. So, you know, Jim might change his address 20 times. We're not going to send you the real-time event stream. We'll send you 20 events, but the data mart will have Jim and just a table that contains his history of addresses, right? So it's a structured data mart. That's the second layer, that the Zeus data mart product. So you can have access to these data marts. Sitting on top of these data marts, we have data APIs that allow you to make API calls and fetch data from our system. And then we also have what we call a report center where we can pre-configure customized reports. And this is what you would typically see as a business persona. Reports could be retention reports, interest reports, ledger posting reports, GL reconciliation reports, settlement reports. These are pre-configured reports that can be emailed, uploaded to an SFTP destination, and viewed online. So there's four different, so if you're a programmer, you'll typically use the live event stream. If you're a data scientist or a data analytics person, you might use the data mark. Uh, as a programmer, you might also use the data APIs. And if you're the product manager or the business person, you'll use the report center. So we have kind of data products for each of the typical personas in a bank. So when you look at this overall then, can you serve any size financial institution or is it just, just pretty much for the biggest organizations? We can obviously serve any size banks or fintechs, any size financial institutions. Our focus right now is typically the mid to large size. So we're, for instance, in North America, we're heavily focused in the top 50 um, financial institutions right now for the first kind of initial phase, but we'll eventually kind of open it out and, and more aggressively pursue even the smaller financial institutions. Okay, so as you look in the next 18 to 24 months as we wrap up this podcast, what do you see as the opportunities, but just importantly, the challenges in the marketplace for payments? Um, from an opportunity standpoint, I think there is true, and I'm, I'm talking not necessarily for Zeta, I presume your question is much more for the actual financial institutions, the landscape as a whole. From an opportunity standpoint, I, I really see, like we talk about this concept of democratizing payments, making payments invisible, and embedding financial services where the customer needs them. 
And financial institutions have this opportunity to move away from this transaction-oriented nature of the business. For the last 40 years, that's all it's been. It's been transactions. I'm going to charge money for transactions. I'm going to earn interest as opposed to the purpose for which those transactions are being um, um, done. You know, when a consumer is performing a transaction, how do I elevate that customer's experience for the experience, for the um, purpose that he's trying to achieve. And I think financial institutions truly have the opportunity to move away from this purely transactional based business model to a business model that is more concerned with the purpose that the end user is trying to achieve, corporates and consumers, both, you know, wholesale or commercial and retail. So I think mean, that's, you know, a big opportunity. And similarly, um, you know, I told you about this whole BBO philosophy you know, why did we create that? We felt like, what, what was the distribution channel for banks for the last 40 years? It's mostly been branches, right? Banks have branches all over the place. And customers walk into a branch, open an account, deal with a, uh, um, you know, teller or a relationship executive. And we strongly believe that the digital equivalent of a branch is this notion that we've created, which is a virtual bank. Now anybody can be your branch. It could be any company, any merchant, any partner, any fintech that can embed your products and services. You had to set up brick and mortar branches for distribution for in the erstwhile world, but now you create this notion of virtual banks within banks, and you're almost lending your charter, if you will, for distribution purposes to you know merchants and partners and fintechs. Because um, Financial services serve thousands and thousands of niche use cases, and you as a bank can't produce every one of those use cases. So you're becoming more of a platform where some fintech might cater and create some really unique product for subprime customers in a certain age bracket. And somebody else will create one for students, and somebody else will create one for small businesses in the advertising space, that need to pay money to Google regularly, like things like that, right? There's so many niche problems. Yep. And by creating these virtual bank operators within the bank, enabling product distribution through digital means and through APIs, you have the ability to empower these fintechs to create experiences that were never created before that solve a really meaningful problem for a specific vertical industry persona customer, but not lose the business because you are still the bank behind that's providing the, the financial products and services. So, so those are the opportunities that, that we really think exist for, for financial institutions. In terms of challenges, um, you know, it is a considerable investment of time and effort that a financial institution needs to make to you know, transition from legacy tech to new tech. Um, uh, there are uh, risks associated with that, which means you need to bring in the right team that will, this can't be a, if you treat it as a parallel project on the side, it might take a decade and you still might not succeed. But if you bring in a, right. a separate independent team whose charter, you know, whose uh, charter is to transform the bank, then you've got the you know ability to make it happen faster in the right way with reduced risk and so on and so forth. I also don't believe the approach should be piecemeal in terms of pieces. We, we prescribe this greenfield approach. We're like, don't go around replacing one piece at a time because you can't take a feature phone and say, I'm going to convert it to a smartphone by replacing one piece at a time. It doesn't work that way. You know, you continue using right. phone number one, but you also start using phone number two. So we typically prescribe a greenfield approach. We say, we set up our stack parallelly, and we say, let your older customers remain where they are start provisioning new customers on this modern stack. Start getting used to it, build your processes around it, and then migrate the older customers over two years, a year, 18 months, three years, whatever time you want to, right? So that's kind of another you know, approach that we suggest, but there's definitely challenges in, in making that migration happen. The other thing is that even though I said, you know, banks don't necessarily lack imagination, but at the same time, you know, bankers are, haven't had digital first DNA and so it's almost like, on the one hand, I give the example of saying you can't win a Formula One race without a Formula One race car, but you also can't right. win it without a Formula One race driver. I could give you a race car, but if, you, if you're going to use a regular driver to drive it, you're still not going to win the race. And so our prescription generally is that build out that independent digital DNA that will 
run this charter so that you're basically kind of incubating this you know, new age modern thinking that can truly leverage this kind of a stack while it's not risking what you already have and, and, and taking this you know, conservatively um, uh, at the same time. And so those are some of the challenges I think that you know, institutions will face um, when it comes to transforming themselves. Bob, and thank you so much for being on the show today. You know, you shared a lot in in a limited amount of time, but I think it's really interesting to see again, and we've gone through this a few times on the podcast where a technology company can partner with a traditional financial institution and quickly get them up to speed if they're given the ability to do what they know to do best. And, and you know, in payments, it's it's a not elective. Um, if an organization wants to modernize it all, they have to start in the payments area. So thank you again for being on the show today. My pleasure, Jim. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. If you enjoyed today's interview, please give our show a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. Also, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and check out the research you're doing for the Digital Bank Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Haslidge, audio engineer, Sean Roe Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Maroos. Until next time, remember, an opportunity exists to partner with industry leaders, building ecosystems that are conducive to innovation and growth. The challenge is actually taking that opportunity and running with it.